I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the European Union's announcement that it will require all products made on the West Bank to be so labeled in order to let Europeans know that the products come from the West Bank to give them a chance to decide whether or not they want to purchase them. The EU claims this labeling process is not a form of boycott. The State of Israel and many in the Jewish community see it differently. And for a sense of how Israelis are viewing this issue, I'm so pleased to welcome back to JBS one of Israel's most outstanding journalists who writes for the Times of Israel, Chaviv Retigur. Chaviv, welcome back to JBS. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Chaviv, do Israelis see the European Union's decision to label products made on the West Bank as a form of boycott or not? There are two views, and neither of them are very complementary to the Europeans. Right. The first view says it's just, um, it's just a boycott. Um, the notion that you would label products in the settlements uh, enabling boycotts and that that's not a boycott step is a, you know, a legal technicality, a fiction uh, in practical terms. If it wasn't supposed to pressure Israel through a mechanism of boycott, they wouldn't be doing it. Right? The very fact that they decided to go ahead with it. It's technically a recommendation. It, 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 nation states can choose not to follow it of the 28 member states of the European Union. Hungary has, by the way, announced that it's not going to uh, follow the guideline. It finds that uh, it, it's opposed to these guidelines. But the guidelines are a recommendation, an official recommendation of the European Union uh, to label these uh, products, and it just doesn't make sense to do so unless it is an attempt to, um, to create uh, uh, the psychological pressure of boycott to enable uh, boycotts on the part of European uh, citizens. Um, so that's one position, which yes. just says, yes, of course it's a boycott. What else is it? <laughs> uh, the other Israeli position uh, actually notes uh, something a little bit more interesting, which is that the European um, recommendations um, include, they're, they're not just the West Bank, uh, where there are, you know, two or three million Palestinians who are not Israeli citizens and a big question about settlements and the big question about whether Israel's going to pull out any time soon and can it pull out any time soon. That whole complicated question that we know as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in which the Europeans have an opinion that's not necessarily always exactly the opinion of the Israeli government. These recommendations by the EU are, include the Golan Heights, Mm -hmm. They include everything conquered in 67. Mm -hmm. The European Union is recommending at this moment to label products produced by Israelis on the Golan Heights so that the Golan Heights products can be boycotted. Mm -hmm. And Israelis are asking themselves, you know, there's, there's no indigenous people on the Golan Heights. There's no disputed territory on the Golan Heights. If you were to go to the very same European officials, the same bureaucracy that is, that is giving these guidelines to boycott or to, excuse me, just label uh, products yes. from uh, the Golan Heights and say to them, gee, do you want Israel to leave the Golan Heights, which the European Union wants Israel to leave uh, the vast majority of the West Bank, yes. which is their position, and they say it openly. Do you actually want us to leave the Golan Heights? And then the European Union says, of course not. Syria right now is in complete collapse. Whatever comes out of the Vienna talks that we're going through right now, it's not going to be the Syria that once was. There might yes. be five Syrias. There right. might be three Syrias. Who the heck knows? Yes. But one thing is for sure, don't give the al-Nusra front, don't give Islamic State, don't give these kinds of groups that at various times have controlled the Syrian side of the Golan Plateau access to the highlands overlooking the Galileans and the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. No, Israel cannot retreat at this moment from a safe position in the face of those groups. It would enable those groups to advance. It would strengthen everything bad that is happening in Syria. When you ask the Europeans, what, do you want Israel to pull off the Golan? They say, of course not. And then you say to them, then what, what are you, what's the boycott about? And, and then the say, answer becomes complicated. What they, do they in say? Other words, they don't have one. They don't so have one. this European Union step, Israelis 
so half of Israelis say, yes, the Europeans are boycotting, they're joining this sort of Palestinian pressure campaign, they're doing it quietly, subtly, without saying that they're actually part of the Palestinian campaign, uh, because I, I think they're, they're uncomfortable fighting with the Palestinians uh, uh, in any explicit way, even though they do want an independent Palestinian state. Um, but when, when, when Israelis then see that there's things happening on the Golan, where the Europeans are setting up for Israel a moral you know, a moral um, complaint from which the Europeans don't want Israel to be able to get out of. They don't want us to pull out of the Golan and then no longer face labeling of our product. Then Israelis start thinking to themselves, gee, this has nothing to do with the Palestinians. What's it, it got to, to do, do with the Israelis? Okay, what's it really got to do with, Khaviv? When you talk to your friends, and if they are in some way either offended or outraged by this European Union labeling. What do you imagine is really behind it? What's the motivation of the EU to, as you now point out, it's not simply the West Bank, and there's a certain kind of logic, as much as we might disagree with it, but you're pointing out once they go to the Golan Heights, there's no logic to it at all. What's behind it? What do you, what do you as an Israeli and your friends as Israelis believe is really motivating the EU? I don't have good polling data. Um, nobody has produced good polling okay, data. Okay, I'm asking you for an instant. Um, What's your instinct? We can expect in the next few weeks we'll see uh, good polling data. So I'm going to give you um, my view of what yes. many Israelis are thinking based entirely on circumstances okay. of conversation. Okay, instinct. Instinct. Um, this, there, there is a sense, uh, <laughs> there's no great fear over this. In Israel, there is a sense that there's something pathetic in it. Pathetic. In other words, it's not. It's yeah. In other words, it's not that the Europeans. Why? So actually, why are the Europeans also worrying about labeling Golan? Right. What is actually now legally? They just simply don't want to admit the territory captured in war. They don't want territory captured in war to be something admissible. So any territory Israel is captured in war is going to be labeled because it's not Israel, in the European view. But but then you do that comparative thing that a lot of people have been talking about. Well, what about Turkish Cyprus? Is that labeled? What about, uh, you know, Crimea? Is that labeled? Now, in some of those places, Western Sahara, which is occupied by Morocco and being settled by Morocco, uh, and that the European Union believes officially is under occupation. Those aren't labeled products, that's all. And there's a huge amount of actually products that come from Western Sahara um, uh, to the European market. So um, the comparative question comes into play. You know, only Israel is not allowed to control territory that is not necessarily completely sovereign. Every other country is allowed without being labeled. But the thing is that the Europeans, to the Europeans, it's very important to say that there is this, this sort of overarching universalist legal principle rather than we're defending the Palestinians, we think you want to rob them of their homeland. Mm -hmm. To say we're defending the Palestinians um, is too um, is too uh, explicit of a position, and so if they they want to they want to defend the Palestinian position to some extent. I, I do think European officials are very upset at the Palestinians and the Palestinian national movement and terrorism and all this, and they do feel Israel has a right to defend itself. Certainly now that Europe is thinking a lot about refugees and Muslim uh, extremism among the European Muslim population, uh, these issues are becoming a lot more complex inside Europe. But they do want to defend the Palestinians. But they don't want to look as though they're defending the Palestinians. <laughs> so it has to be this sort of legal issue that is not actually the Palestinians in order for it to be legitimate to be defending the Palestinians. That's where the Golan comes into I play. See. For the Israelis, of course, they read it in the exact opposite. They're right. saying the Israelis read that cowardice as, um, as malice, because the Israelis are then saying, well, I don't understand. If this is to defend the Palestinians, fine. Two-thirds of the Israeli electorate wants to pull out of the West Bank, or most of the West Bank, because they want to separate from the Palestinians. We know that from every poll in the last 15 years. Yes. That's a legitimate position. But to start thinking that, any, that Israel, can even, Israel can even get out of the labeling of its products on the Golan, because you want to both label them and delegitimize them, but also not want Israel to actually end that policy that you're delegitimizing, 
Then it's just because you hate us. So the Israelis are reading the exact, you know, they're reading, um, I think, and I think a lot of Israeli politicians and leaders also think, that um, Israelis generally are reading European cowardice as European malice. Uh, and so it's a very confused hodgepodge policy uh, that wasn't carefully thought through, and I think the Europeans are starting to worry about it. By the way, we heard in the last couple of days, Federica Mogherini, the high representative of the of a joint, you know, foreign sort of Europe's foreign minister, uh, say that there's going to be, you know, re-examination, re-discussion of the labeling uh, guidelines mm -hmm. in the European Union system because of all of these sort of. It's not clear. The, the message is so unclear. The standards are not universal. All of these problems that suddenly came up after they already implemented it. Okay. By the way, it feels so offensive to Jews. American Jews who care about Israel and care about Jewish identity and a sense of Jewish people, it is so offensive to us. It sounds at the same time, Chaviv, as if Israelis, I don't know, they think it's sort of silly and don't take it seriously. But the reality is when the European Union makes this kind of statement, it has some reverberations in world communities that is certainly anti-Israel in feel. Do you not agree? Oh, let me, let me agree with you. Also, Israelis, the average Israeli, certainly the average Israeli news report, thinks this is malice. Okay. Not, not that this is, you know, um, uh, cowardice and confusion. I think the Israeli um, foreign uh, service and Israeli uh, leaders, including the Kud leaders who have come out, you know, very strongly against it, Ultimately, they believe that they understand, they know these European diplomats, they understand that this is the product. But, yeah, at the end of the day, Europe is labeling products from the Jewish state yes. and not from, you know, Arab states that occupy other states. And, 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 and to label when, you're in, when, it's, you know, when Jews are involved and not even to say openly why yes. uh, it, it looks bad. Okay. Put it that way. It, it's I, not something that Europe can do okay. easily right now. I also want you to clarify for our viewers, there's a different status of the Israel that is on the West Bank and Israel that is in the Golan Heights. Explain to our audience the difference in terms of territory annexation and Israeli law. Um, that's really fundamental. Um, that's, that's, thanks for asking that question. It's very important to understand because uh, it it, uh, it says, you know, that question essentially is, what does Israel think? Um, official Israel is under Israeli law as it stands today. The Knesset can change that law. Um, a very small part of the territory Israel conquered in the 1967 war. In the 1967 war, in six days, Israel quadrupled the, its size, the size of the territory under its control. Something like 85% of that territory has been given back, mostly on the Sinai, a little bit in the Arava, uh, desert to Jordan, in the peace treaties between Israel and Jordan. And what is left is the West Bank and, and the Golan Heights. The West Bank um, is a, a small section of the West Bank that is actually within the municipal boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. Yes. Uh, Israel has annexed. Yes. Israel says this is Israeli territory. Uh, uh, people living here have the right to Israeli citizenship, and several hundred Palestinians actually receive Israeli citizenship every year. I don't know the exact numbers, but they're, they're available. You can look them up. Um, um, because they're Jerusalem residents, we live in East Jerusalem, and Israel offers citizenship. In principle, the Palestinians don't vote. You know, in, uh, they don't want citizenship, and they don't vote in Jerusalem municipal elections, which they have the right to do even without Israeli citizenship, because they don't want to recognize Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem, of the parts of Jerusalem that are over the, over the Green Line, over the ceasefire line of 1949. But Israel, in its own internal law, the city of Jerusalem beyond the Green Line, which includes, of course, the Kotel, the Old City, the Temple Mount, um, the Mount of Olives, just the, the most sacred places in Judaism, um, are pure... Israel. They exactly. are Israeli civil law applied. Exactly. Now, the rest of the West Bank is not part of Israel. Exactly. Under Israeli law. Exactly. It is, it is under uh, Israel. Israeli law uses a term that is used in international law in the Geneva Accord called belligerent occupation. Belligerent occupation is not a bad term. 
in the law itself. Um, it means that it was territory captured in war. War is legal, and sometimes in a war, to win the war, to fight the war, you capture territory. And that is okay in international law. And the laws of belligerent occupation tell a state what that state is allowed to do in that territory. Um, and, and, and Israel wants the West Bank to remain under occupation because it doesn't want uh, to annex the West Bank and yes. give citizenship to the Palestinians, okay. to the millions of Palestinians living there. The Palestinians do not want Israel to annex the yes. West Bank and give them Israeli citizenship. Yes. They don't want Israeli citizenship. And I, want, Aviv, yeah. I want you to repeat that again. Israel has not annexed the West Bank. It has not annexed the West Bank purposefully. And the Palestinian communities on the West Bank don't want Israel to annex the West Bank. Although, as you point out, everybody should understand, Jerusalem has been annexed by the state of Israel, which is why when Israel talks about buildings, uh, adding building inside Jerusalem, Israel does not consider Israel to be the same kind of community that Ariel is, or communities, you know, or uh, Kiryat Arba is, which are known as West Bank settlements. The United States seems to argue that the pieces of Israel that Israel has annexed in East Jerusalem are still settlements. And therefore, the American administration refers to Israeli building on, in Jerusalem, even on the, in East Jerusalem, as settlements. But you're making a very important right. distinction that not every viewer understands. The areas in which Israel has formally annexed territory that it came, uh, it came under its control during the Six-Day War, and areas that it has not annexed. And your point is, the West Bank territory is territory which the State of Israel has consciously, purposefully, not annexed, even though, Chaviv, there were people inside Israel who argued that the best thing Israel could do early on in the late 60s and the early 70s would be to annex that territory. And over years, the issue of what that territory status is would no longer be in doubt because Israel had, would have annexed it. And again, your point is, which I'm, I'm just reiterating, but you said it beautifully, is that the land on the West Bank was taken by Israel in a defensive war during the 67 war, and then Israel made a conscious decision not to annex it. That is, in essence, what you said. I then want you to talk about what Israel did with the Golan Heights. Yeah, um, so everything you said is exactly right. Let me just emphasize that right-wing Israeli government, Israeli Knesset that were completely dominated by the right wing, which is something that happened in the 80s, and it's something that is right now uh, taking place have not annexed the West Bank, Correct. and the people who argue that we should annex the West Bank are a very, very small uh, minority. Yes. Even today in this very right yes. sense, nobody wants to annex the West Bank, even those who talk about wanting to annex the West Bank don't actually. And the reason is obvious. Um, we don't want to give all the Palestinians their citizenship. We're not, not going to annex a place and not give citizenship to the people who live there, right. because we won't give up the democracy that we have built with great sweat and blood and tears. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so, so that's a very stable thing. The Israeli right wing don't believe the hype and don't believe the PR. The Israeli, not of Israel's critics, and not of the Israeli right wing itself. The Israeli right wing does not want to annex the West Bank to the point where the Jewish Home Party, which is the far right of the Israeli Knesset today, there's the farthest right that sits in today's Knesset. That's not a judgment. It's just where they sit on the spectrum. Um, they talk about annexing only the parts of the West Bank in which Palestinians don't live. Mm -hmm. And the Palestinian population centers, the Palestinian city, that is called under the Israeli-Palestinian Oslo Accord, you know, peace agreements, uh, areas A and B, uh, those parts of the West Bank, Israel would not annex. Under the plot of the Israeli far right in its campaign platform in the March election that we just had yes. uh, earlier this year. So 
the Israeli far right, which, which, you know, which is a mystical religious, you know, orthodox party, it used to be called the National Religious Party, who believe that God wants us to. The beginning of the coming of the Messianic age is the coming of the Jews back to their land, including the biblical heartland of the West Bank. They even don't want to annex all of it because they don't know what to do with the Palestinians there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there, Israel is not annexing the West Bank, completely conscious, and for very serious and profound reasons. Whether they're right or wrong doesn't matter for our discussion. On the Golan Heights, um, Israel did... Um, it, it, the, the legal technicalities don't matter. Israel extended civil law to the Golan Heights. The fact that in the West Bank, Israel has been annexed, it means that Israeli civil law doesn't apply in the West Bank. There's a special military law uh, in the West Bank. By the way, not just for Palestinians, also for uh, Israelis. So Israelis living in the West Bank, for example... Um, if you are in, um, for example, you are a business owner in Tel Aviv, and you fire a pregnant woman, women who are uh, at certain stages of their pregnancy have some have some for about a, for about eight months or whatever it is, they have some labor protections. You can't fire them for that period to make sure that women have that sort of time in which they don't just get sort of thrown out on their feet. and stuff go while they're you know, specifically when they are pregnant and giving birth and have a child. And then once they come back for six months to your job, then you can fire them just like you would any ordinary person. It's a labor protection for pregnant, for mothers, essentially. That law does not apply in the West Bank Mm -hmm. to Israelis. So if you are a business owner in the city of Efrat in the West Bank, and you have, and and there's a pregnant woman that is, uh, you know, working in your business, you can fire her much, much more easily than if you were in Tel Aviv. Even the Israelis live under a different law because it is not annexed yes. by Israel. So this is a very real phenomenon. It's not a legal fiction. On the Golan Heights, Israel didn't declare the Golan Heights part of Israel, as it did with Jerusalem, um, but it, it extended civil law to the West Bank. The West, uh, I'm sorry, to the Golan Heights. Golan the Golan Heights. Heights are not under a military administration of the IDF. And it gave citizenship or offered citizenship. Not all the sort of there's some pro-Syria Druze villages, uh, on, the, on the Golan Heights, uh, that not everyone wants Israeli citizenship, although hundreds in the last month have asked for it. The Druze on the Golan Heights are giving up on Syria. Um, uh, but everyone in the Golan Heights can get Israeli citizenship if they want it. And, and, and the Golan Heights is just a completely democratic part of, uh, of Israel. Exactly. De facto, the Golan Heights has been annexed. Israel yes. claims it as, it as its own, and it just offered citizenship to everyone living there. Um, and so it's, it's a completely democratic step. Uh, whether you like Israel, don't like Israel, agree or don't agree with the step of annexing, uh, it was completely democratic. Everyone there gets a vote and becomes a citizen of Israel in every sense of the term. Uh, okay. So that's the Golan Heights. So, yes. so, so when the Europeans lump the Golan Heights in with the West Bank, yes. the places we need to label, you know, there are no Palestinians on Golan Heights. Why does it matter to you? Yes. You yourself don't want us to pull back, to pull off the because it would only further destabilize Syria. So why are you morally, you know, why do we have a, a scarlet letter on our foreheads, uh, what, you know, when you, when you don't want us to be able to get out of having that, you know, moral shame that you're trying to create for us? And in our view, the Golan Heights is Israel, and the West Bank, in our view, our Israeli view, is not. Yes. Not yet, not Currently, yes. will in the future be a Palestinian state? Israel really disagree, but it's not Israel. Yes. So, yeah, so the Europeans are a mess. Yes. Yeah. I guess it's a take home. You're terrific. You say it so well. You help us understand it better. Uh, in the little time I have remaining with you, I want to ask you a different question. I just want your, your instinct, your gut reaction. I hear, Chaviv, more and more a certain kind of criticism of Israel that because of the recent wave of Palestinian knifings and, and uh, you know, Arab, uh, Israeli Arabs taking to the streets, trying to harm and murder Jewish Israelis, running them over with cars, shooting them, stabbing them on buses, that there is, this is what I've heard, people argue that there is the edges of a growing racism in the state of Israel. As someone who is observing Israeli life every day, Chaviv, to what extent do you worry that Israeli, that Israel, Israelis, are becoming racist? Um, I worry a lot. 
Uh, and the reason I worry a lot, first of all, let's let's put one thing out of out of the way of this discussion, and and it's usually the undercurrent that is unstated and that makes these discussions so painful for people. Israel isn't going anywhere. Delegitimizing Israel by saying, oh, those Israelis are all a bunch of racists doesn't mean anything. It's like delegitimizing the country called Canada because I don't know what racism is growing in Canada. It doesn't mean anything. Canada doesn't disappear. It doesn't stop being a country. It doesn't go away. Okay, so let's talk about Israel's problems, Israel's emotional, psychological, social, sociological, educational, inter-ethnic, interfaith problems. It has every problem under the sun, just like every other human society. Uh, it's not... You can't delegitimize it just categorically. It's not something that can be delegitimized. So we can have a discussion, and, and I think, you know, your viewers should know, you can have a discussion of Israel. Every single fault of Israel is cracked wide open to the world. You know, yes. The Israeli journalists publish in every language under the sun. We alone at the Times of Israel publish in Mandarin, Chinese, and Persian, and Arabic, and yes. French, and, of course, in English. Uh, and, uh, and we can have this discussion. So to the actual point, uh, which whether it delegitimizes Israel or not is a question for Israel leaders. Okay, Khabib, that was a very Sorry. important point for you to make, but I can only give you one minute to just give me your overview, and then the next time we talk you can develop it further. In general, why are you personally worried about a racist tendency in the state of Israel? Because it's a, it's a conflict between two nations. Um, it's it's uh, it's a compl the the anti-German uh, feeling in France in World War One and the anti-French feeling in Germany in World War One were you know wall to wall and deep and profound. Victor Hugo, after the 1870 German occupation of Paris, w wrote uh, you know never speak of it but 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 remember it always revenge right revenge against the horrifying terrible German right um, it, Israelis. Can easily be convinced that Arabs hate them and want them dead. It doesn't help that there are very good polls of the Palestinians produced by Palestinian pollsters that show that a huge numbers of Palestinians, majorities of Palestinians, support the terrorism and violence against Israelis. Um, and and uh, and that very very quick. Th those hard facts easily slide into intuitions and mm -hmm. easily slide into these sort of these these prejudices and stereotypes um, that uh, that are dangerous because they cloud the mind and and and, and they're not fair and uh, we have seen violence. Uh, there's been two or three events out of you know I think we're at four dozen you know stabbings now. You can look it up, but it's it's we're in, we're in dozens and dozens of stabbings. But there have been three, maybe four events of Jews being violent. And people they, that, that they thought were Arabs and sometimes weren't. An Eritrean asylum seeker uh, who was shot and beaten by a mob right after a Palestinian terror attack. And this is a terrified mob, and we can talk about all the reasons, etc. But nevertheless, they just beat up a, a guy because he was dark-skinned like the terrorist who he was not. The, I you know, the terrorist was a Bedouin from the Negev, and they're much more understand. dark skinned than Palestinians from the Galilee. Anyway, the point is. Uh, there was even an incident in Kiryat Atta, which is a suburb of Haifa, in which a Jew stabbed another Jew, thinking he was an Arab, in an attempted yes. revenge terror attack yes. against an Arab, and then found out he was a Jew. Because okay. there are a lot of Yemenite Jews and a lot of Jews who come from the Arab world in Israel, and they look Arab. Prejudice I... is a real problem, and okay. it's a real threat, because okay. this really is a war between, a conflict between two nations and peoples and tribes. Khabib, I have to cut you off only because yeah. I'm out of time. I want to pick this discussion up with you. You bring such wonderful insights into what Israeli life is. You're fabulous. I appreciate you're always giving me time. So uh, I will call you off, and you continue to do the work you're doing, continue to write. You're a marvelous journalist, and very often you'll get to share your views with our audience. You, you really enrich us tremendously. Thank you, Khabib, very, very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Good blessing. Thank you. Khaviv Retegur, who writes for the Times of Israel, again, a marvelous, a marvelous journalist who has a great deal to say about Israeli life today. We will turn to him often. My thanks, as always, to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, Dara Golub, and the producers of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal and Jan Weiss. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.